Today we're going to talk about Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. As I've mentioned before, Newton's Law, even when it came out, wasn't 100% accurate. Um, matter of fact, Newton's Law was actually just expressed as a proportion as he wrote it because he didn't have instruments sensitive enough to measure what we call the universal gravitational constant. I'll show you what that is today. Um, but that constant we were able to make into an actual equation, not just something you know, proportionality. But even with that, it still wasn't accurate enough to say predict some of the problems with, say, Mercury's orbit. It's pretty good. It gets 95% you know, of the stuff, but the more you start examining the problems, the uh, more it breaks down. So again, we know Newton's law of gravitation is wrong, but we use it because it's very simple, okay? Uh, simple compared to you know, Einstein's equations. So with that in mind, we're gonna look at uh, Newton's law of gravitation. <coughs> so these are his first three laws here, which you guys know and love. <laughs> Nothing new here, but we're not really talking about those, but it's kind of an extension of the three laws of motion. The first one is the law of inertia, and the object of motion stays in motion, not object of rest stays in rest, unless acting applied by an outside force. The second one, you know, it's just F equals MA, you can apply a force to an object that has a mass, it will accelerate. And the third one, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, we, we know that, all right? So we take that, but we, we talk about what we learned with circular motion, we start to go, okay, well, how does that change things? So if we go back to that story about Newton sitting in a tree, apple hitting his head, the story or the saying goes that like, oh, the apple hit his head, and that's how he envisioned gravity. No, that story is probably 100% wrong and never happened. Um, so why do they tell the story? Well, the whole point of the story is that Newton was the one who figured out that gravity is universal, right? He is the first one to make the leap to say, you know, the, the, the thing, this invisible thing that's pulling down, say, an apple from a tree, that we call it gravity, is the same thing that causes the planets to go around the sun. He was the first one to make that connection that not that gravity just pulls stuff down, but gravity is universal. That's a pretty big leap to go, oh yeah, the thing that caused something to fall out of the tree is the same thing that causes, you know, the sun to orbit the Milky Way galaxy. Like, that's a pretty big jump there. So <coughs> here this talks about, you know, Newton's obsession with the uh, moon and other planetary bodies. Um, we're not getting into like the, uh, as it says here, Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Um, but basically, a little history lesson for you is there was a guy uh, by the name of Tycho Brahe, and he was kind of a rich guy, and he spent most of his time um, documenting, very carefully documenting the positions of planets and moons and different things that he could see with his telescope. And he wrote them down in his books. And after Tycho died, um, or Brocky died, he had just stacks and stacks of this data, right? And Kepler came along and he wanted to use Tycho's data to make you know, predictions about the planets. And essentially, Brahe's state told Kepler no. Uh, Kepler broke in and stole his notes anyways. And then he used Brahe's notes to derive the laws of planetary motion. And Kepler has three laws, we're not really gonna get into those. Um, in this, in physics really, in this type of physics, because it's just a little bit beyond what we our scope, it's not too hard to learn, but. Um, so Kepler had already established these laws, and so 
shepherds of the earth. Uh, what they think is most of y'all might realize that Jupiter is a big planetary body. And because of its size and location, uh, the theory is that Jupiter absorbs a lot of debris that's roaming throughout the solar system. And by absorbs, I mean like you know, meteorites, asteroids, comets crash into Jupiter with a fairly high frequency. It doesn't happen too often anymore because theoretically there are most of them are crashed into Jupiter. But we say it shepherds the Earth because it protects the Earth from asteroids hitting us. Um, that's the thing. So, the reason that the tether between objects had to be a gravitational attraction. Like, because you can't see, you know, the Earth. If you're looking between the Earth and the Sun, do you see anything holding them together? No, like if you think about going around in a circle, like if I have a ball and then the string and I spin it, you're like, okay, well there's the string. But you don't see any string for, you know, Earth going around the sun. Likewise, you don't see any string for, you know, pulling an apple out of a tree. So he reasoned that it's this thing we call gravity. So, Newton had a thought experiment. It's a really neat thought experiment. And it really requires you know all of these different things from um, our previous units on motion. So this is his thought experiment. Newton's thought is, okay, you got the Earth. Just we have them fall, we have this curve here, 
match the curvature of the earth. So that for each distance that they go over, they fall down enough that they don't hit the earth. That is orbit. We have satellite, we have thousands of satellites in orbit. We have like the International Space Station. All of this is only possible because, well, the earth is round and because we have these things moving fast enough. But that's the key. Was Newton ever able to get things moving fast enough? Absolutely not. Uh, minimum orbital velocity is between 17,000 miles per hour and about 25,000 miles per hour. If you go less than 17,000 miles, is 17,000 miles per hour fast? Yeah, that's pretty fast. If you go less than 17,000 miles per hour, what will happen? You will hit, come back down and hit the earth. If you go more than 25,000, what will happen? Yeah, you'll leave. This is what's known as escape velocity. So, when you see these things, like this is how orbit works. So Newton figured this out, you know, back in the 1600s, way before we had anything uh, that could go that fast. But it turns out, it's pretty simple. And there is a buttload of stuff up in orbit. Right? So, but it, it all comes from his thoughts about how gravity worked. But it also explains exactly how, like, say, the moon works. Like, the moon is just a satellite that goes around the Earth. And it's at a certain distance. If you calculate how fast it's moving, well, it's just falling around the Earth the same as anything else. But it's got a pretty large sideways velocity. It's the same reason why the Earth goes around the sun, right? It's falling towards the sun, but it can't get to the sun because of how fast it's moving sideways. So, what Newton reasoned was that everything that has mass has gravity, right? And each object with grass attracts every other object with mass. So, <coughs> looking at this, he wrote his law of universal gravitation, which we'll see here in a second. Um, here you see more of the uh, Einstein interpretation of gravity as, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the sheet with, you know, when you put mass in it, it dips it different sizes. Um, here, uh, these are links to different things. Um, this is like planetary size comparison, stuff like that. I'm not going to click on those right now. You have to click on them on your own. Um, but it's a pretty good sampling size. Uh, the reason why I put this stuff in there it's not because you so much need to know it, but you know, I just talked about like you know Jupiter and the Earth and the Sun, and if you're not really familiar with those celestial objects, well maybe you should familiarize yourself to make sure you know what's going on. So this here is Newton's law of universal gravitation. Uh, this is the one that you're expected to learn. So let's talk about it. What do you think the letter F stands for? Force. So F is a force. Specifically, which force? Force of gravity. Um, what do you think M stands for? Mass. How many masses are listed in this equation? Two. two. So Newton's law of gravitation is just for two masses. It's any two masses. But with Newton's law here, we calculate the force of gravity between any two masses. What do you think, well, it says R here and D there. What do you think those letters stand for? It sounds like right is down there. That's completely wrong. Um, R or D is simply the distance between the centers of each of their masses. Sometimes it's written as R, sometimes it's written as D. The reason why it's written as R is because if you look at something, say, like the Earth, if you want to find the gravitational attraction between you and the Earth, it's between your center of mass and the Earth's center of mass. Where is the Earth's center of mass? It's at the center of the Earth, basically. Right? And your center of mass is, well, somewhere here. But the Earth 
has a much larger radius than you are tall. So it turns out that you know, the force between you and the center of the Earth is the distance ends up being based on just the radius of the Earth. Does that make sense? But if you're looking at, say, between like the Earth and the Sun, it's not just the Earth's radius. It's this well, the big, long distance between the Earth and the Sun. Does that make sense? So don't think of this as R. Just think of this as like a distance between the centers of the two objects. And then last but not least, we have big G. And big G is going to be the most confusing thing uh, if you don't pay attention. Big G is not the same as little g. Little g is what? It's the acceleration of gravity, which we know is what number? 10. All right? This is not little g. That's little g. Okay? And I'll show you how big G and little g are related to me. Big G is the universal gravitational constant. And it's basically just a number we made up to make this equal. And it's a very small number. Like little g is 10. Big G is this number right here, 6.67 times 10 e is times 10 to the negative 11. That's a very small number. Okay? So it's basically a number that I say made up. We measured it you know, in a lab. So it's not like this made up. But we measured it in a lab, but the thing is, is we needed it to be something for this to be an equation that worked. Um, so here, this slide lists what all of these letters mean. Uh, like I said, the R, or you can call it D, is, can be a little confusing. Um, so keep an eye out on that. And then remember, big G is that number right there. It is in the uh, constant, it, you should never have to find it, okay? It's just a given number. But remember, big G is not the same as little g. So, let's see here. This is how big G was actually found through this, called the Cavendish experiment. I'm not going to go into detail, but essentially it's just, you know, just putting two masses near each other and measuring the force and then going backwards to calculate the uh, g. Here, this chart at the top is just emphasizing, emphasizing that gravity is by far the weakest of all forces. Um, so the weakest force is gravitational, then we have the weak nuclear force, and the electromagnetic force, and then the strong nuclear force. Okay, so here's an example that says if we know the masses of two objects, any two objects, and you know the distance between their two centers, you can calculate the uh, gravitational force between them. All right? So we're going to do a little problem here. start it here because I do want to go through a problem. Uh, well, hopefully that's better. Okay, so Let's, um, yeah, okay, I guess annotation. Let's try this problem here. Now, it says that you can do this for any two masses, right? And in this case, we're going to do the mass between a person and the Earth. So I'm going to do it, you know, together here, so we're not going to do it just for... Um, so here, this tells you how you can do it for your you in particular, and you should try that. I'm going to do an example up here on the board. But the whole point here is that um, 
Um, do you do this with any two matches? Now, I know some of you, especially you boys, thinking you got yourself a new pickup line. Because if this is a force of attraction between any two masses, well, you can simply tell somebody, or somebody you're interested in, be like, you feel this attraction between us, right? You feel this gravitational attraction between us? Obviously, it's because you're so massive, right? Um, no, it's a terrible pickup line. Now, so let's talk about, because you can calculate force between two people. Uh, I'll tell you this much, because of that tiny G, this is going to be a tiny force between people. It's so small that you're not going to feel it, right? You don't walk by somebody and just feel, oh, God, they told me this one. No, you don't feel that. So let's calculate the force between you and the Earth. So the first thing I want to do is I want to find the mass of a person. And I'm just going to go ahead and use my mass. So my mass is about 100 kilograms. I'm going to do this as an example. So if I wanted, I could find the force of gravity, right? F equals MA. I remember this. In this case, what's the acceleration of gravity? 10. So what's my mass, in this case it's 100 kilograms, times the acceleration of gravity is 10, right? What's 10 times 100? A thousand. A thousand newton. Okay. So that's how we calculate that force. So let's see what's going on here. Okay. So how do we use this formula? So according to this, it says F equals big G, M1, M2, oh, I'm not going to rewrite it, sorry. Um, well, in this case, M1, we'll say is my mass, okay, we got M1. So in order to do the rest of this, I need to know M2, I need to know R, and I need to know big G. Well, big G is easy, that's a constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Um, Newton. Okay, so we know that. Do we know the mass of the Earth? Well, it gives us right here. This is the mass of the Earth. Okay. It's 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. 5.98 e to the 24th. I'm going to try to remember. And then the radius of the Earth is 6.38 e to the 6. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and change that to the mm -hmm. That way we're consistent. Okay. So <coughs> technically, we should be using not just the radius of the Earth, but we should also add our height to that, or at least our height to the, our center of mass. But I don't care what your height is. Most people are less than two meters tall. And this is 6.38 times 10 to the 6. 10 to the 6 is a million. So saying the radius of the Earth is six, over 6 million, 6 million, 38,000, whatever. It's over 6 million meters. Does it matter if I add two meters to that? So instead of bothering to add our height, we're just going to kind of round it off. Okay, so let's plug this in. So what you should do, what you should be doing, is you should be calculating this along with us. Now, obviously, I'm going to get the answer up here, but kind of the point here is to make sure you can type it in the calculator, right? Because there's a lot of ways to screw this up. Uh, you have a lot of options here. You can type each one in individually or you can type it all in together. It doesn't matter. Whatever is more comfortable for you. And so I'm going to write up here exactly what we're going to plug in, you know, and then I'm going to plug it into the calculator. So literally, this is F, I'll write 6.67 e to the negative 11, right, times M1, which is 100, times M2, which is 5.98. You know what? I'm going to move this so it looks normal. Um,
24th. Still around. I guess it's been running against the line. Divided by the distance between the squares. That square is very important. So do not forget the square. And this thing, the number one thing that students miss, you know, once you get used to typing it in, is the square. Do not forget the square. The second thing is forgetting the cube. Um, so in this case, the distance is 6.38e to the 6th g. And so we cannot forget the square. All right, so what do we get? So I'm just going to type it in my calculator up here, just as one big step. Uh, feel free to do what you want to do. But we should all get the same answer in the end. So I'm going to type 6.67e to the negative 11th times 100 times 5.98e to the 24th. e to the 24th, is that a lot? Yeah. yeah. That's not a million or a billion or a trillion or a quadrillion or a quintillion or a sextillion. That is almost six septillion kilograms. That's, that's a lot of mass. Divided by the radius in there, so 6.38e to the sixth, and don't forget to square it. Here I get a force of 979. Nine eight. Nine point nine, whatever. Newtons. This, okay, so first of all, did everyone get about nine hundred seventy-nine? If you did not get it, you either did not do it or you have an issue. If you have an issue, please tell me now so I can help you. So this is this is the practice. Alright? Are there any issues? So it says that my force of gravity between me and there is about 979, nine, I'm just going to write 980 newtons, okay? Are you okay with me rounding that? Now, earlier, I had you type like this, right, this 1,000 newtons. What does that have to do with this? Well, this should be the same number. Are they the same number? No. But what did I have you use for the acceleration of gravity? 10. What should we use? 9.8. Remember, we just rounded that to 10. Well, if I did 100 times 9.8, what do I get? 980. Y'all with me here? This number, just doing F, times, or F equals MA, and this big old thing that we just did here should give me the same number. Now, again, we rounded 9.8 to 10. It's fine. But they're not coincidentally the same. Okay, this is not just some random coincidence. This is where G comes from, that little G. I just told you, like, back a long time ago, I said, okay, well, we're just going to call it 9.8, we're going to round it to 10, I'm not really going to explain that. I'll explain it later. Uh, here we are, it's later. You, if you measure the acceleration of gravity, it comes out to be 9.8. So you might question yourself, why does it come out to be 9.8? Well, it turns out, this in this formula here, this 100 kilograms, that's me. Y'all see that? Is this me? No. Is this me? Uh, and like these numbers are not me. These are the Earth, and this is the universal gravitational constant. It turns out that if I take this 100 kilograms out, so I say F equals this M times G, let's say M1, M2 over the distance squared. If I do this, you'll see how I pulled that M out which I can do, by the way, because the order of operations is multiplication and division. Does it matter what order you do multiplication and division? Absolutely not. So if I pull that out, it turns out this equals acceleration. Like this is 
turns out that equals acceleration. Like that is what the acceleration of gravity is. And you can prove that to yourself if you did, you know, big G, the nine, you know, this 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, times the mass of the Earth, divided by the rate of the Earth squared, you get about 9.8. But that's where 9.8 comes from, right? It's, it's not coincidentally the same, because the Earth is what's causing the ground. You all with me? So what I'm telling you guys right now is when you go to do the audit today, I'm going to give you some problems. And if I give you a problem that's like, okay, calculate the force of gravity between Bill and Sue, well, you're going to have to use this big old formula. So if I say, calculate the force of gravity between the Earth and the Sun, we're well, going to have to use this big old formula. But if I say calculate the force of gravity between Bill and the Earth, you can use this big old formula, or you can use this. So we bend. Does that make sense? Because some of these will be the exact same problems that you've had before. In that case, you can use the stuff that we used before. Now, for those of you who aren't paying attention, you're going to end up using big G and this the whole time, which is fine. It'll give you the correct answer. It's just I think most of you will agree that's more work. But this works all the time, whereas little g only works for small objects on the Earth. Does it work for small objects on the Moon? No. You'd have to know the acceleration of gravity on the Moon, which is not 10, by the way. It's uh, 1.6. So, <clears throat> now, I want you guys to realize something. In this problem, I'm like, kind of like the force between you and the air. And y'all are like, okay, fine. And I told you my mass is 100 kilograms. Did I show you guys me measuring my mass? No. But you can take me out my word. Maybe you trust me. Maybe you don't. Maybe I just made that up. But in the end, you're like, okay, it's fine. Because the thing is, is if I had to measure my mass, or you guys had to find your mass, could you do that? You can think of a way to do that, right? So then right up there, I'm like, here's the mass of the Earth, here's the rate of the Earth. How did I find those things? I mean, sure, I Googled them or whatever. I didn't Google find the numbers. Like, when you take a step back and just think about that for a second, like, you can find the mass of the Earth. You can find the mass of the Sun. You can find the mass of Jupiter. Like, at least when it comes to the mass of the Earth, we're on Earth, right? I don't know about you, but I ain't never been to the sun. But you can Google the mass of the sun right now. You ever stop and think about how weird that is? Like, at least, you know, when you give me the radius of the sun, okay, somebody looked at it, you know, probably with some sunglasses on and kind of did some measurements. You go, okay, it's about that big. You know. The radius of the Earth is actually pretty easy. It turns out um, we've known the radius of the Earth for about uh, 6,000 years now. Um, uh, Ptolemy, one of the uh, ancient Greeks, actually measured the circumference of the Earth about 6,000 years ago. And he just used some sticks and really the shadows cast by the sun and some geometry. Turns out it's not too hard. The hardest part is that he had to get two different measurements. One was in, you know, Athens, Greece, where he was. The other one was in Cairo, Egypt, where he wasn't. And he had, he literally paid somebody to measure the distance between the two cities. Like, go walk. Now, there's a job. But the radius or circumference of the Earth, we've known pretty well. Now, his calculation back in the day, that uh, wasn't exact, but it was pretty close, actually. Um, so even though that's a pretty remarkable thing, I mean, at least we can go up and take pictures of the Earth, and again, you can kind of do the same thing. Maybe you can imagine for the sun, for the radius, but the mass is weird, isn't it? I mean, you think they just took a scale and put it upside down? Yeah. For that reason, right? No. Essentially, we got it from this formula. Because it turns out, you can solve this formula for anything, and it's math. 
And once we knew G, which we mentioned in the Cavendish experiment, like those are two known masses that we measured the force between, and we knew the distance, so we could calculate G from that. It turns out that once you know G, and say you know the force of gravity on you, like you know, you can measure how hard it's pulling me down, right, with a scale. I know that force, and the force has to be equal and opposite, so that I can use the force, or my weight, G, and the radius of the Earth, and my known mass, and solve the mass of the Earth, or solve the mass of the Sun. So it turns out this is how we know the mass of the Earth. And it's important to note that this mass includes everything. It includes babies that were just born, it includes mud puddles in Saigon, everything. So it's a pretty useful formula. All right, and so this slide here is just talking about how um, the mass that you, or not the mass, the force of gravity you get from the previous answer, it's basically the same as what you get for just using 10, right? Which we already talked about. So, it says here, how does the mass of an object change the gravitational force? Well, more mass, more gravity, right? And how does the distance affect gravitational force? Well, more distance, less gravity. But it's not quite as simple with distance because distance is squared, right? If you double the mass of an object, you'll double the force of gravity. But if you double the distance, it doesn't give you half the force. It actually gives you one fourth the force because R is squared, okay? So some of the problems that you will get on your audit are gonna be just straightforward calculations. Some of them are gonna be like, hey, you have an object that's this big, and then you double it. What happens to the force? Well, it's gonna be nothing, right? Or say, oh, you, you move twice as far away. What's the force? Well, it's gonna be one quarter, whatever the original was. So some of them are gonna be big, heavy calculations. Actually, not too many of them are. But some of them are just gonna be like proportions, right? And you double the mass of both objects. What happens to the force? Well, it's gonna be four times big now. So here, it says, what would happen to the force of gravity if one or both masses were doubled? I guess it's the same step question. It's four times as much if both were doubled, just double twice if one was doubled. And so here it says, what would happen if the two, the distance between the two objects were doubled? Well, that would give you not half the force, but one fourth. So first of all, distance is on the bottom. So they have an inverse relationship, force and distance, right? More force, sorry, more distance, less force, or inverse. But mass and force are directly related, more mass, more force, right? But distance isn't a simple inverse relationship. It's an inverse squared relationship, okay? So do not forget the square. So I guarantee you, you know, all these problems when students ask me questions, they'll be like, why did I get this one wrong? Go through the calculations. Literally 80% of the time, you missed it because you forgot the square. Right? Do not forget the square. And that's it. So that's it for the notes today. Uh, close to the end of class. <coughs> so that's good. So we finished the notes. Um,